Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg with BeyondMTHFR.com. And I've, I'm bringing to your attention something that I've been researching very carefully over the last several months, um, and that is the relationship between methylation, MTHFR, and small intestine bowel overgrowth. Now, this is a big subject. We're breaking it up into two videos. And what I want you to realize is that SIBO or SIBO, as we call it, um, is a lot more common than we first thought. The reason that SIBO is a problem and the reason I'm talking about it is many of you who have been researching methylation have heard from different doctors and practitioners that you have to start with the gut first. And that kind of makes sense and you know we all nod our head in agreement well yeah sure but this is the explanation of why you have to make sure that the gut is in a an appropriate healthy state before you can benefit from all the wonderful things that methylation support can do for you and that's my goal in giving the giving you this video and this post is to explain how that works many people come into my practice with Digestive problems, bloating, acid reflux, diarrhea, constipation, general discomfort, abdominal pain. We see a lot of overweight patients, but we also have underweight patients, patients who seem to be not absorbing the nutrition they're eating. This is all going to relate back to SIBO, but SIBO can cause all of those things I've just relate I've just listed. They can it can cause all of those symptoms. And even the medical research itself is saying that SIBO is more common than we once realized. The reason this is going to become a problem for the methylation world is when we're looking at a chart, and this is a chart from um, our friends at mthfrsupport.com and Sterling's app, but this, this report, I have cut and pasted different SNPs together to show you that when someone has these SNPs that you're looking at on the screen, you're looking at imbalances in the methylation cycle that are going to be provoked and made worse by a gut problem. Meaning people with gut problems like SIBO, and SIBO in particular, are going to have their methylation cycle even more distorted because of what's going on in the gut. That's why the gut has to be treated first. Okay. There's one thing you take away from this video, you have to start, you have to rule out. You don't always have to start with the gut, but you have to rule out that the gut, um, rule out to make sure that the gut is working well so that you can get the most out of your treatment after that fact. We see a lot of genes in the IgA category. IgA genes are going to make it more likely that leaky gut is present. And leaky gut is a different animal altogether than SIBO, yet they commonly occur together. So to, the take-home message with this is you can have leaky gut and not have SIBO. There's lots of different situations that would cause that. However, you cannot have SIBO without leaky gut. In other words, every individual with SIBO has a leaky gut, not everyone with a leaky gut has SIBO, S-I-B-O, okay? So, but these genes make it more likely that the leaky gut will be around. When we started researching this problem, um, you know, I was looking into research about, okay, what's really going on in the gut? What What's the gut made of? What's the difference between the small intestine and the large intestine? And there's, there is quite a bit of difference. Uh, this picture comes from a, an article published in Nature Immunology in 2013. 2011, excuse me, and I've, I've pasted into this slide, and what you're looking at is these little graphics represent the populations of bacteria, and what you should notice is that in the duodenum and the jejunum, or in the stomach, there's, there's, almost, there's nothing in the stomach, and there's really not that much in the upper small intestine. It's only when you get down into the later parts of the small intestine and the large intestine itself that you see a large population of bacteria. That's normal. That's very normal. You're supposed to have more bacteria in your colon 
and in your jejunum than you do in the other parts of your intestinal system. That's the way it's designed to work. So this is normal. SIBO, SIBO is going to be an imbalance where you're going to see a lot more organisms growing up here in the duodenum and the jejunum, and those organisms cause problems. So I found this fascinating, but and I'm pulling a lot of uh, research out of this one review article because it was just full of, of great information, uh, gastroenterology and hepatology 2007. But you can actually have a doctor, a gastroenterologist, stick a, an, endo, an endoscope down someone's throat, through their stomach, and look at their small intestine. And they can see evidence of celiac disease into the doctor's camera. It looks exactly the same. But in fact, it is not. You can have the diagnostic marker of celiac disease from having too much gram-negative bacteria that normally lives in your colon living in your small intestine. So the takeaway message with this, with this is SIBO is such a big problem that it can damage the lining of your small intestine so that when a doctor sticks a camera into your intestines, they can't tell whether you have celiac disease or SIBO because they look exactly the same. That's a powerful idea. The good news is when you fix SIBO, these, the lining of the intestine grows back. I have worked with patients who told me this in the past and we didn't know why that was happening, but here's the evidence as to how that works. Having SIBO causes damage to the small intestine that's exactly the same as celiac disease so when you're looking for the diagnosis, the doctors get confused. Rule out SIBO first. SIBO causes gross malnutrition. So having the wrong bacteria in your gut means basically that every time you eat and every time you take vitamins, the bacteria eats the vitamin. The bacteria eats the food first. That won't, that's not the same thing as saying that you the person are getting the nutrition from that food. I mean, you're swallowing it, chewing it, and it's going into your stomach, but the, it may not be going into your body. So this is how people in our country develop malabsorption syndromes. They can be malnourished because they don't absorb very well. And one of the big problems we see is protein malabsorption. I see this all the time on blood tests and people's, uh, you know, um, protein stores dwindle and this is a picture of that famous uh, condition called kwashiorkor where you know you get swelling and bloating in the abdomen and loss of muscle mass on the frame. You now a lot of individuals in our society don't look like this uh, artist, artistic rendition but we can have di different degrees of protein malnutrition just because of our uh, bacterial overgrowth. So I wanted to show this to you because it's hard to absorb carbohydrates, it's hard to absorb protein, and as you'll come to find out, it's hard to absorb really lots of different vitamins when you have a bacterial overgrowth in your small intestine because what's happening is every time you eat or take supplements, you're throwing fertilizer on dandelions and thistle, okay? That's not going to lead us where we want to go. This was the study that just, this was the 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 reference that really got my attention on how SIBO can cause all kinds of methylation problems. And what you've got to understand is, um, you know, the work that Dr. Lynch is doing and other researchers about folic acid, they're bringing attention to an important topic that, you know, folic acid uh, may not be the best form for us and certainly people with, with methylation issues have a sensitivity to folic acid. So we want to, we want to control our exposure to that. And we don't want to we want to we don't want to have high amounts of folic acid in our body. I think we can all agree that's a that's a problem. But that's all good and well, right? But what we haven't talked about yet, and what I've discovered in the literature here, is the cause of all that high folic acid. And what happens is small bowel intestinal overgrowth right here causes excess folic acid. That's right, folic acid. They call they use the word folate in the literature, but I assure you they are talking about specifically folic acid. Folic acid is a byproduct of these bacteria that live in our small intestine during SIBO. 
So here's what's happening. There's way too many bacteria in our gut, in our small intestine. It's, it's far overgrown. And the bugs there are eating the food we're eating, and they're pooping out lots of folic acid. That folic acid leaks into our body and begins to disrupt our methylation cycle like we know that it can. All we have to do is reference this chart, and basically you can see that, you know, unmetabolized folic acid is a problem. It's a very big problem because it means that the methylation cycle is being stressed and being slowed down with consequences on our chemistry and on our genetics. This is a study from all the way back in 1986. Basically, they said that bacteria cultured from subjects with gastritis were able to synthesize folate in vitro in a, in a petri dish. Atrophic gastritis results in folic acid malabsorption, but not in folate deficiency due to increased bacterial synthesis of folate in the small intestine. So what's happening is, and they're using the word folic acid in lieu of folate, but I assure you they are speaking directly about folic acid. These bacteria that grow in our gut with SIBO produce high amounts of folic acid, and they're, they're responsible for most of the unmetabolized folic acid that is showing up on blood tests with people. I mean, people don't even take supplements containing folic acid, and they do a test, and they have high folic acid. Well, the reason why is that they have an untreated gut infection, and that is why you have to start with methylation uh, start with digestion and treating methylation problems. But there's more to the story, right? There always is. So we already know that there's excess folate, but we also get a deficiency in all the fat-soluble vitamins, so vitamin A, D, E, and K, omega-3s, choline, and other important nutrients. We also get vitamin B12 deficiency, we get iron deficiency, we already talked about carbohydrate and protein deficiency. So this is a big issue because people who have been on antibiotics, as I'll talk about in the next video, people who have been on uh, proton pump inhibitor drugs, acid reflux drugs, people who have been given um, you know, medical interventions to change their digestive tract have a much higher risk of having small intestinal bowel overgrowth and now we know that small intestinal bowel overgrowth doesn't just make you feel bloated and gassy and have diarrhea or have discomfort there's much more to it it's actually impairing your methylation cycle because you end up with excess folic acid a deficiency in B12 and all these other important vitamins that are necessary for our bodies to work well so what I wanted to end this video with was just by reiterating that SIBO is common. This is your normal gut flora, okay? More in the large intestine, more in the colon than the small. But what happens is over time, because of, like I mentioned, stomach dysfunction, proton pump inhibitor drugs, antibiotics that they're using too much, this bacteria starts to creep up and colonize the large, small intestine and so there, get, there becomes way too much bacteria in the upper small intestine. That's in, in essence what the problem is. When looking at the methylation cycle we know that it produces folic acid in high levels and we know that this folic acid can become unmetabolized folic acid which as we know in the methylation world begins to inhibit how our methylation cycle works because it's a competitive inhibitor for folate and 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So that is the first video on SIBO. This is why we start with the gut first. So if you're listening out there and you're dealing with you're dealing with a gut issue that you've been unable to figure out on your own, um, reach out and contact me. I can I can help you through that. We've had We've had really good success helping patients uh, restore normal gut function. It doesn't take six months. We actually have a program that can do it um, fairly quickly. And your gut, uh, when once that digestive system is more balanced and you've you've 
restored the bacterial balance to your digestive system, then the opportunity arises to go deeper into your body and do all kinds of um, you know, life enhancing, health enhancing techniques to help your methylation cycle. But just remember, if you put the cart before the horse and you're an individual who may have some of these SIBO symptoms and has a gut problem, giving you vitamins right away uh, likely makes you worse. And so this is the reason why most uh, or many um, supplements and many foods make people sick. It's not what's in the supplement, it's what's in the gut. Thank you very much and please, um, questions or comments, please direct them to, uh, to me at my office or at beyondmthfr.com. Thank you very much.